Tēnā koutou katoa and hello everybody. Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. My name is Ben Aldelberg and I'm coming to you from Tamaki Makara, Auckland. Tēnā kamihi ke te mana whenua o Aotearoa and we acknowledge the local tribal authorities of New Zealand. And g'day, I'm Emma Strutt and I'm currently coming to you from Durrambul country in Queensland. Before we dive into our conversation today, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And finally, if you enjoy this podcast, please like, share or comment on our social media and consider buying us a coffee to help support our work. Now on with the show. Our regular listeners will know that when it comes to anything regarding fresh water and the state of our waterways, we have our go-to person, Dr. Mike Joy, a regular on the show, and we listen. On this episode, we bring a fresh perspective on what we believe will be a very similar message, and you will listen. That's right. So Chloe Price is a freshwater ecologist and environmental scientist based in New Zealand. And outside of her busy day job, Chloe is also a member of Project, um, the Project Blue research team. Project Blue is a homegrown NGO with the purpose of raising awareness of the harms of plastic pollution on our environment and the failures of Western recycling systems. So we've got a few really important topics to cover today. Chloe, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Chloe, we only just met a few weeks back at the film screening of Toitu Te Whenua, a documentary by Jeff Reed, whom we last interviewed in Season 3, Episode 18. This was hosted by Sustainable Future Collective at Auckland University, and I had the privilege of hosting the Q&A panel, of which you were a guest. We only had a limited time for each panellist, and I thought we need to bring you onto the show and allow you to, do a li- to have a little more freedom to dive into so many elements that you touched on. But first your backstory. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your passion for water and the environment. Yeah, cheers Ben and yeah it was awesome to take part in that panel with such absolute frothers for the environment um, next to me. Certainly some some yeah big big um, amazing mana in that space and it was yeah a real honour just to to participate and, and hear from all of you I have to say that and from the kids and the students in the room like the energy was amazing and it gives me so much energy. Um, but yeah, my background, I guess, I'm originally from Whakatū in Nelson, um, the top of the South Island, and I grew up doing a lot of tramping. I spent a lot of time in the most beautiful parts of our country. I'm really, really lucky to have that connection. Um, and even able to to drink from streams. I remember when I was a kid, would fill up our water bottles um, as we walk along some of the tracks that were so lucky to experience, um, going swimming in these crystal clear waters, um, grew up with the Marlborough Sounds as my backyard as well. So boating and swimming in these amazing, amazing places and really had that very, very strong connection to both the fresh water and the marine space, which obviously are completely interconnected um, from a very young age. But at the same time, um, my family are camper vanners. Um, my parents and my grandparents, we grew up in, in camper vans and traveling around the country, never been overseas together, but seen every inch of the country. Um, and so I was really exposed from a very young age to our country in its entirety um, and therefore to both the amazing natural environment that we have that's in such a pristine state in places, but also to the degradation that's been going on for a long time. And, and from a very young age, that was really clear um, to me that, yeah, we're not quite as clean and green as we make ourselves out to be. Um, and I think that that connection, um, yeah, it, really just loving playing in streams when I was a kid as well and being able to play with little coda freshwater crayfish in, a, in the bottom of our driveway even and then watching those drying up over time and getting degraded really drove me to be quite passionate about working in this space and in particular in the freshwater space. Um, I actually never was going to do science or work in this space because it was kind of intimidating and I was like I can't do that. Um, that's I'm not smart enough for that (laughs) Um, and only ended up jumping into it after I was already studying something else at university and kind of saw the program at AUT um, and went, you know what, that sounds awesome and I'm passionate and I want to give it a go. So shout out to everyone out there that doesn't feel like they can do it, just give it a shot. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and and so I've been studied for about six years in total. Um, in environmental science, but so quite broad um, looking at the environment as a whole. Uh, but then sort of focusing down and on freshwater. Um, And over time, and I guess we'll sort of talk about this, but over time, my passions really shifted 
um, a lot more into the interface of people and the environment and, and how that connection that we have with the environment is really, really important to nurture um, and recognize because if we've lost that connection and we don't care and, and don't realize that we're part of a whole, then it's very hard for us to actually recognize that degradation's happened. We need to do something to enhance and look after our environment. And that if we don't, that actually has an impact on our own well-being. So yeah, my current focus is really more on that interface between people and, and our fresh water and the land. Yeah. Now, for someone that started off uh, not wanting to study science, you became an award-winning researcher while you were doing your master's. You won the Beatrice Moore Prize. So big congratulations for that, firstly. Um, but your thesis relates to an article that you published late last year regarding biodiversity offsets in the freshwater environment. Yeah. We've talked a fair bit about the biodiversity crisis in a couple of very recent podcast episodes, so this is really timely. Um, and we'd really love to know, firstly, you know, what kind of offset measures are actually being used and mm -hmm. what your findings were in regards to whether they're, they're effective or not at achieving positive outcomes. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, when I did my undergrad, I then went on to do a uh, um, sort of studentship at Auckland Council. Um, it's a really awesome opportunity where you get to work in the environmental monitoring team and work across all domains, so freshwater, marine, terrestrial, um, and do the state of environment monitoring. So you guys will have seen the recent report that's come out from the Ministry from the Environment on the not so good state of our freshwaters. Um, that data is collected by all councils around the country. Um, there's some programs that are monthly, some yearly to gather that picture. And so I was responsible for doing the field work there. Um, and part of that studentship, there was training for a course called the Stream Ecological Evaluation Method, uh, which basically is a way, this framework and biodiversity offsetting in general are grounded in accounting and finance and economics. And that's sort of a framework that's then been transitioned onto ecology and biodiversity. Um, and so this is one of those tools that was developed here in New Zealand. We're very good intent. Um, and, you know, to, to the best that we can, because I, I have used it, it's one of the few tools that we have that looks at stream function, it measures sort of functional health. And that field assessment is good and well, but what happens with the data that's collected in the field assessment to look at stream functional health, so um, things like, is there intact habitat for indigenous fish? Um, is the riparian zone well connected to the streams? Are the tree roots growing in and helping to strengthen banks? Is food being provided? Is there shelter and so on? Um, so it collects a lot more than that, but that all kind of gets compounded into these numbers, which are then put into a formula, which for when development works are happening uh, that relate that result in, say, the loss of stream area or loss of stream length, say because a, a residential development is coming in and they need to divert a stream to make room for more houses or a mine's being developed and a stream, a length of stream is actually going to be lost because of that mining expan expansion. Um, this formula and these numbers can help the assessors to determine how much offsetting is required. So where the impacts that were um, inferred by that development couldn't be avoided they couldn't be minimised and they couldn't be mitigated. So I'm not sure if you've discussed previously, but there's the, a thing called the mitigation hierarchy that's applied throughout the world um, in resource management to look at how we can protect the environment through ongoing development and ideally minimise and avoid harm. Um, biodiversity offsetting is sort of like the last step. Well, then there's compensation, but it's one of the last steps of that hierarchy. So ideally, we don't come in and cut the tree down. We build around it. Ideally, we don't come in and move the stream. We move our housing to fit around it and live with it. Um, and then when that can't be done, you get to the steps of offsetting. It's like, okay, we've had to have this impact, can't be avoided, but how can we make up for it? Um, and so, yeah, so this tool was used to try and make up for that residual loss. And as a student, I was like, this sounds really whack. <laughs> um, how are we using these accounting frameworks to sort of um, barter off our environment like it just it just sounded really bizarre to me um, and it kind of it felt like it went against my values and and sort of what I'd learned in this space and I really wanted to learn more because it sounded really risky biodiversity is incredibly complex um, you know whether you look at it from a high scale or, or go go micro scale 
when you're looking at a, a stream or a forest, you're not just looking at the trees or the fish, you're looking at the soil and at the tiny invertebrates and at the interconnections between all of those things and are different at every scale and in every place. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I decided to look into that for my masters because here in Aotearoa, we do stream offsetting. Um, wetland offsetting is a practice that occurs not at great scale, but it does terrestrial as well. Um, and now there's organizations looking into doing marine offsetting um, because in the past it was sort of like if you can't avoid and you can't minimize, then a bit of money goes into a bucket at council to make up for that loss and it could pay for like a park bench or something that was obviously completely disconnected from that loss and harm. So this is kind of like an, a better step than that. Um, yeah, and so decided to investigate that. Um, which, as with all master's research and even PhDs, is probably like biting off way more than I could chew. <laughs> um, yeah, always a bit aspirational. Um, yeah, that's, that's how I ended up getting into that. Um, yeah, where have your discussions gone so far in the biodiversity offsetting space? And in, in Aotearoa, is this focused on terrestrial? Well, we haven't really had any decent discussions around mm, mm. offsetting measures, more just yeah. what the problems are. So it's yeah, interesting okay. to know whether or not these are actually effective or, as yeah. you say, if it's just fancy accounting. Yeah, yeah. So so my research focused on actually looking at on-the-ground offsets. Um, so rather than focusing on the policy or focusing on um, the failures or successes of regulation, um, it was actually just going onto the ground and going, okay, have these offsets achieved what they're intended to? So one of the sort of core principles to biodiversity offsetting is this idea of no net loss. And so that, again, it, it sounds quite accounty, accounting-y, and it, and it is, but that's intending that there's no net loss of the biodiversity values or the, the values environmental um, that were targeted through the offsetting between the impact site and the offset site. So say, again, working with streams, because that's what I was studying, but say that um, a length of stream in one place was lost and with that was a specific type of habitat for a specific community um, and specific riparian values. So the riparian zone was, say, mature forest or it was recently planted, um, regenerating native forest or it was gorse or whatever. Um, you're wanting to ensure that at your offset site, the work that's done there to enhance the environment is at least equivalent to or makes up for the loss that happened elsewhere. Um, one of the, the battles I have with this is always that you're enhancing a stream or you're enhancing a wetland or enhancing forest that already existed, but you're permanently losing the area that, mm -hmm. that was there before. Um, and I, I guess that's where, in the context of, of the mitigation hierarchy, this is a better than what we had before outcome but it's something I just struggle to get my head around and there's no answer for um, I guess and so no net loss of those values so yeah whether it's using a tool like I use the stream ecological valuation model which helps to sort of document all of that in a scientific manner um, things like protection and perpetuity so the site's meant to be once that enhancements happened um, so say the measures might be like, okay, we need to create some in-stream habitat to enhance the in-stream habitat quality at the offset site to bring it up to standard or beyond. Um, we might also need to do some riparian planting to provide shade and to provide leaf litter and food inputs. Um, we may need to fence it off because there was stock access, not that that should be there anyway. Um, I, in my mind, ideally, we'd be looking a lot further upstream and having a catchment scale lens. So, okay, are there upstream pressures? Um, such as further stock access upstream um, or poor land use management practices. It's rare that that kind of consideration is given yet, but I hope it will be in the future. Um, and then that needs to be protected. So someone can't come in and doze that site where the enhancements happened another 10 years in the future for a future urban development. So it should be, the offset should be equivalent in nature, it should be protected in perpetuity. Um, and yeah, there's several other measures like this, but Ultimately, when I went on the ground, I was looking at these different principles and measures, as well as the actual SEV, so the field scores that the scientists had gone out and collected, um, to see whether change had happened in a positive direction towards their sort of no net loss goal at these sites. Um, and part of the challenge in doing this, and, and just in general, um, and, and working in this field, 
in the environmental field broadly in general is that change and and sort of succession and enhancement and recovery happen over really long time scales there's some functions and elements of ecosystems that do recover really quickly um, and that can without assistance recover really quickly but there's other elements that that take decades or even lifetimes and we're really impatient um, and our resource management law and the way that development's consented is usually at time scales of like 25 years max and things like monitoring often happen at scales of five years max so that really doesn't give enough time for us to truly understand whether the work that we're doing is working although we're increasingly working on ways to do this and to to try and find those early triggers or look at trajectories and so on um, and yeah ultimately my research showed that well the sites that i could actually assess progress on um, which were very few because our resource doc, resource consenting documentation um, is quite fraught and record keeping is not good um, there's plenty of other researchers out there that have done some some really good work on revealing that the eds environmental defense society have, have published some great papers looking into our resource consenting um, but yeah ultimately there was very little indication that this is currently working um, for a couple of sites they smashed it the the enhancement work was really really good um, and so and you never want to blanket say everyone's doing a bad job of this um, but ultimately the lens that we were applying to the enhancement was often too narrow um, so it may be that in the past and this is changing i'm seeing some improvements in this space in terms of not just using a blanket approach to enhancement but people just go on and plant trees when the stream itself was actually degraded really heavily and, and had pressures from, like I said, upstream um, or from previous land use and therefore um, sedimentation, nutrient loading and so on were really affecting the in-stream habitat quality and just planting a buffer wasn't going to be the, the only solution to that problem. Um, there, were, there were other things where yeah, developments had, had used diversions as offsets. So essentially when you're moving a stream to follow a new path, um, that's loss of natural stream, but then some of that new extent, because it went further than the original one, would be used for the offset link. I don't know that that would necessarily be permitted now, um, but when those were done, the diversions of streams and, and recreation of, of ecosystems in general, um, the science there is, is often quite new, um, at times quite unproven, and we don't know how long it takes for those natural functions to actually recover or even if they get there at all um, to be present again um, and so sites like that had just totally failed um, often just completely overgrown with weeds and a lot of riprap and rock being used which isn't really mm. good for for streams it heats them up and yeah yeah so it was a bit of a it was a bit of a sad picture but um yeah the positives that have come out of that is that there's now some data um, and some some storytelling that I've been able to put out and been able to publish um, around the actual on the ground state of this practice, um, and yeah, it's it's a really challenging space because if we don't offset, then the next step is to compensate. The ideal situation is to just not be permanently harming our environment in general, and and I'd really like us to be there one day, and I think we can. Um, Another person you guys should definitely talk to, a um, colleague of mine, Stu Farrant, who works in water sensitive design. There's, there's water sensitive design um, sort of movements around the world and, and there's increasingly um, a push for that here in New Zealand where we build around and live with our water and our natural environment as much as we possibly can um, rather than yeah paving over it. Um, yeah, so for me just to continue heading in that direction is the dream and, and that's the space that I'm working in um but yeah there'll always be critical infrastructure such as say a state highway or a hospital or a school or something that maybe has to go here and this is where these tools have their place um, but i think we really need to be more black and white over time and it'll be interesting to see how the new resource management reform speaks to this um, in terms of drawing a line as to how much loss we can accept versus maybe that's not justifiable yeah 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 there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure with housing um mm. and as we're yeah. seeing especially in south auckland where housing is going it's taking away from us 
uh, fertile land where we grow food. So the food's now got to be grown elsewhere and it's yes. this ongoing cycle. And these offsetting tools, you know, initially I was going to say, well, they're just a band aid, but they're not even that, you know, they're failing mm -hmm. in, in most respect mm -hmm. because they just, uh, it's just another form of greenwashing, you know, tick a box. Yes, we're doing that. Great. Let's go on and bulldoze everything over and, and just concrete and, and, and so on. So, you know, without stating the obvious, which you have already, we should now be protecting what's mm -hmm. left. What, what are the main causes of the degradation of say our waterways? You know, you've mentioned some of them, but mm -hmm. let's be a bit clearer. Let's create that awareness. What exactly are the main factors here? Yeah, well, I'm sure Mike's giving you some good rundowns on this, um, but <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a complex picture, and there's no one individual action to blame. But it's ultimately the way that we use land, um, and I I even that term in itself to me is I, I don't like because it's the, the use of land. You know, we're we're one with the land. We shouldn't be using it as this extractive resource, or at least if we are, we should be acknowledging that we just completely rely on it for our own sustenance and, and well-being and yeah I think that when that relationship was or has been broken and degraded over the years through um, certain ways society's progressed that's led us to where we are now um, here in Aotearoa it's really been over the last 200 years that we've seen a really marked decline um, ultimately when New Zealand when, when settlement really pursued at pace here a lot of our wetlands were filled in um, and so we, we've lost a huge extent of our natural wetlands um, and streams and that really paved the way for farming to be able to be established in areas that really aren't suited um, to extractive and, and impactful industries like farming or at least um, not industrially scaled um, and so yeah, obviously we, we know the picture with, with farming in New Zealand and I won't point fingers at particular industries, but um, there's a lot of land use that's happened over the last 200 years continuously on that same vulnerable land that's led to cumulative impacts. So sediment runoff from land um, as the natural topsoil has been lost and degraded, um, a lot of that's gone to the waterways and then what remains and, and um, what's then laid onto the land washes straight off, so fertilisers. Um, stock excrement, clays and, and other sediments that just continue to sort of clog up our streams and our estuaries. We need to remember that our streams are connected to our estuaries and they're also really suffering and they're often um, left out of the picture um, in these discussions. Yeah, so so yeah, definitely some of the land use practices. Another big one, and this is a topical one at the moment obviously, with the state in Tairawhiti and, and Hawke's Bay with our pine plantations. So again, Decades ago, um, through the early 1900s to mid 1900s, there was a really big push for pine plantations um, onto our steep hill country. A lot of this land is really erosive, so as these are uh, felled and come down, um, there's periodic releases of a lot of sediment into our waterways. Um, some of our other horticultural practices can be quite heavy on water extraction, so when you're interfering with the groundwater tables, or both both horticultural and agricultural. Um, you're extracting groundwater for irrigation, that's putting pressure on groundwater tables, which then at the same time you've got infiltration of contaminated water. Um, and so water that's contaminated with nutrients, fertilizers and so on, um, getting back into that groundwater. And then, yeah, it's just a cycle, <laughs> a continuous loop of, of this contaminated and unhealthy water being put onto the land and then coming into our freshwater systems. Um, yeah, so, so extraction, um, sediment and nutrient loading, we've got sediment loss from hill slopes, um, we've got our urban areas, urban sprawl as you've mentioned Ben is, is a massive problem, especially in Tamaki, like we've got one of the biggest urban areas in the world even though we don't have a big population and we're just sprawling and sprawling and sprawling um, and the pressures there, although you know it might be argued that our sort of agricultural, horticultural land uses take up a much bigger footprint um, those pressures are really, really pronounced in urban areas for stream loss, wetland loss, um, vegetation loss, although most of that's been cleared back when we were um, yeah, burning the land for farming back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, urban uh, stream syndrome is a massive problem, so contaminants from urban roofs, from tyres, from industrial land uses, 
some a lot of these are more like heavy metals although i've got a lot of science coming out around emerging contaminants like personal care products microplastics um, these are all getting into waterways adding to that degradation adding stresses really intense stresses um, in some of those urban streams for fish macroinvertebrates um, and that's all going downstream again into our estuaries um, often getting in both the estuaries and streams often these contaminants as well end up sort of nestled in the sediment and they can settle there for years and then you get these sort of lag times where it takes a really big storm event or some other event to resuspend and then contaminants that were laid years ago are still causing issues years down the line i think that's an issue that um, people often aren't aware of as well is that just because we're doing things better now doesn't mean we're not still going to be seeing the negative effects of impacts from years ago for years to come um, and what do the sort of cumulative effects of our ongoing activities have when you compound on top of all of that? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's big, it's, it's challenging. Um, mm. And ultimately it comes down to our relationship with the natural environment and the fact that we have been, it's been a very extractive relationship. Um, and yeah, we've really sort of forgotten that, that we're harming ourselves as well as all the other organisms that live in the environment, as well as the physical environment itself. Um, and like I said, that's why I think it's so important that this this discussion brings people into the picture more. Yeah. Yeah. You've spoken about a lot of runoffs into streams, into estuaries, eventually into mm. our oceans. Mm. Project Blue, NZ. Tell us about this documentary. What inspired it? Yeah, so so this is a funny one, and, and for a freshwater ecologist and and someone who's yeah so focused on on biodiversity, uh, going into the plastics crisis probably seemed like a bit of a segue. But all of the crises around us are so incredibly interlinked, um, and as I noted, the the way that we use or the way that we discharge to water, especially in urban environments, in terms of our, our washing machine discharge through wastewater treatment plants, can actually discharge a lot of plastic. Um, the way that we consume and can throw away waste, sometimes in mindless ways, can lead to plastic and cigarette butts, especially don't get me started on them, um, going straight to our waterways into the ocean. Um, and so it's always been something that I've definitely been interested in. And as someone who tries to live as sustainably as possible, minimizing plastic's always been a, a passion of mine. Um, but when was it? It must have been 2018. I saw a social media post from a friend about this group called Project Blue. Um, and it looked really cool. Everyone was surfers. I was just getting into surfing and they all seemed really passionate about the environment. And I always kind of wanted to get involved in, in something like this. So I reached out um, and a couple of weeks later sat down with Savannah, the founder of Project Blue, after a surf on the beach at Woody in Auckland and talked to her about it and was just completely sold. So the co-papa of Project Blue originated from Sav going on her OE um, in Cambodia and really firsthand being affected by her personal contribution to the plastics crisis. Um, seeing some a wrapper, it's, it's this is part of our opening in our film, but seeing a wrapper that she used get like thrown straight into a rubbish pile in a big paddock in rural Cambodia and going, oh my God, that was me. Um, which I think we can all relate in, in ways to those aha moments um, of, of our impact on the environment. Um, and yeah, so her, her real drive then was to come back and learn more about this problem and talk about it and educate about it because she thought that she, you know, knew a lot um, and, and realized that there was a lot more to learn. And that was why Project Blue was born. So the purpose of Project Blue as a whole is to educate about the plastics crisis and why it's an issue. Um, document the issue here. So so again, Aotearoa is always seen as clean and green. Um, the situation with our fresh waters, the situation with our forests and possums, which I'm sure you've talked to Jeff about, um, the situation with our marine environment, those those aren't the only issues. So the, the way that we consume, we are incredibly, um, unfortunately, we're an incredibly wasteful country um, and we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and the way that we waste plastic and, and, and process plastic and contribute to the plastic crisis globally is not minor, um, although we might think that's the case. Um, and so, yeah, really sharing that picture here and, and really educating as to how our recycling systems currently work and why those aren't necessarily fixing the problem at the moment. 
and then as to what we're doing on the ground it's got some amazing grassroots initiatives here in New Zealand to turn the ship around um, is our drive and so we spent the next I think it's been yeah, about three years creating a film documentary film um, to tick all these boxes um, and then premiered it right as we went into our biggest COVID lockdown <laughs> which was fun <laughs> um yeah so we had a whole lot of energy and, and drive and then um, went into lockdown for months and months on end um but yeah it was just an amazing project to be a part of because at the time everyone was under 25 when we started and there were about 25 of us and everyone was from completely different backgrounds um like we had tradies we had filmmakers we had people in fashion industry policy science um everything under the sun um and for a lot of the group, they were early on their journeys or, or hadn't really dug into their journeys in sort of sustainable living, um, didn't necessarily know much about the plastics crisis. So the whole crew kind of learned along the journey. Um, and, and yeah, just it was amazing seeing that transformation. Um, part of what we also were doing, which isn't necessarily part of the film, but was working with schools as we were documenting and, and creating the film, um, so we went and did some workshops with a few schools around the country and did a few hui, um, like for example, sustainable coastlines with Rangatahi um, to just talk to them about this issue. But more than anything, to hear what they were passionate about in the environmental space and to uplift that energy. Um, because, as I mentioned, the plastics crisis is one of many. Um, they're all interlinked. People go, why aren't you talking about climate or why aren't you talking about fresh water? And it's like, well, we can't talk about everything all at once. Um, but as long as everyone's talking about and having momentum and all of these issues together, we can move forward. Um, and so, yeah, a big drive for us was to try and spark and uplift that energy, um, for, especially for kids, for whatever it was they were passionate about, um, whether it be waste or not. Um, and yeah, that was, that was really positive. Yeah. You mentioned recycling before. Um, mm. And, you know, it's it's not the most important step in the waste hierarchy, but it's a concept mm. that a lot of people, I think, seem to focus on as the main solution. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it comes in plastic packaging, but I'll just recycle it and it'll go around and around and it's a nice, clean, circular system. Um, but it's not that simple. And, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've been to Malaysia and seen the other, other side of it. So yeah. what's actually happening when someone in Auckland, for example puts their plastic waste into the recycling yeah so when someone puts their plastic waste into the recycling the assumption is that it's going to be recycled right it, it's going to get turned into some other product and, and that's kind of the end of the picture um, the big problem with our recycling systems is that they're incredibly fragmented all the councils across New Zealand do things differently some they work together but ultimately there's there's different systems different areas um, and in some areas, the councils may require that your jars are crushed, for example, before they go in the bin in order for their either processing humans that are doing it or for some that are using robotics and other technologies to be able to properly separate the recycling into the right stream and get it to where it needs to go to be recycled. Um, others will require or, or ultimately all should require that what you put in the bin is clean. So if you put dirty products into your bin, like a pizza box, for example, pizza boxes shouldn't go in the recycling bin, they should get shredded into the compost or unfortunately chucked out. Um, those dirty products contaminate the whole bin um, and can lead to literally entire bins of recycling, if not going to recycling plants and contributing to issues, just going to the to the tip, like entire truckloads um, can just get tipped because there's too much contaminated waste. Um, so what we found was that because of these issues with the disparities in how recycling is with the symbology, with the the way that households need to process it and separate it before it goes out, um, with the cleanliness, with all these different factors um, that people aren't really told about. People don't know. You just got a bin. It's like, chuck your stuff in there and feel good about it. Um, there's, yeah, there's hopefully going to be initiatives coming that will, will improve on that. Um, but yeah, it, it led to us to to want to dig further and find out, okay, so where, where does this actually go? Where does our recycling go and how does it actually get turned into new plastic? Um, and that trail did un, uh, ultimately lead us to Malaysia. So um, some listeners might have heard over the last few years about some of the sort of news that came out with China shutting the doors on taking in other countries' waste because they're ultimately like the dumping ground for the world. Completely fair. Um, 
and that led to recycling from developed countries all over the world being shipped to other countries, mainly in Southeast Asia, so Malaysia, Indonesia, for example. And why this happens is because we don't have the capacity on shore to process all of our own recycling. Like we just create too much waste um, to process here in our own country, which is like the definition of unsustainable living. Um, but that is currently how things are. And so ultimately a lot of the waste that we create, we don't have the facilities to turn it into new products or to the raw product that's needed for plastic at scale. Um, in some places we just don't even have enough facilities to process all of the plastic. Um, and so we ship it off and it's the same France, America, Australia, they all do the same thing. Um, and when we ship that off again, the assumption is that this is good, nice plastic that's ready to roll and, and be recycled. But because of that contamination and the mixed nature of our plastics, a lot of what goes offshore is mixed in quality and therefore it can end up going down different pathways once it gets to its receiving country. And so what we found in Malaysia is that a lot of the recycling, including ours, that's being sent via shipments, like shipping containers over there. Um, some of that's being processed legitimately in good factories that do everything to whatever their environmental standards are. Um, and, and then we're getting the myrtles, the raw materials back to use um, to create new plastic drink bottles or whatever it is, plastic bags. Um, for some of the waste that's too mixed or too dirty, that's going elsewhere. Um, and that elsewhere looks like and has looked like um, illegal recycling factories or, or sort of grey recycling factories um, where they will be extracting the good stuff and, and making profit off that um, but then doing other things with the not so good stuff, the contaminated plastics. Um, and what we found on the ground was that other thing could include dumping the plastics. We went and visit some, we visited some sites where there was, it was just crazy like multiple square kilometers of buildings just filled up with big bales of mixed plastic waste from other countries um we found plastic products from here from australia from france from america just like in the middle of these areas that could have been really nice residential areas but ultimately won't be developed because they're dumping grounds um burnt so some of the factories burn overnight um and we learned and spoke to some locals that had been directly affected by this burning of plastics. It's really, really bad for your health, obviously. No one wants to breathe in carcinogens every night. Um, yeah, burnt off was a big one. Um, yeah, or otherwise just dumped in big, like mass landfill dumping areas as well. So it was pretty crazy seeing all of this happening and, and knowing that we're directly contributing to this in a country which has already got its own waste problems that they need to, to work through um, at, a, at a big scale. Um, and knowing that we're contributing to that social and environmental devastation was, yeah, pretty awful. Um, yeah. Was it Auckland or Wellington Council recently that they, it's a little mini expose where they discovered that all the council bins that in public spaces where they might have two or three bins that, mm. you know, they collect them all as one and dump them all. So even though in public, in counts on council land, and you know whether you're on a main street, I think it was Auckland, but I stand to be corrected. You have I, a recycling bin, you have a general rubbish, but they collect yeah. them all as one. It's and it's literally the feel good factor. That's yeah. all the only reason why they do it. That I actually didn't know about that, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, it would probably be Auckland because we've got those bins, the three bins all over the yeah. show, especially in the CBD. Yeah. It's not as widespread here in Wellington. Um, yeah, but then I don't blame them because yeah. you talk about contamination and yeah. you know, I had this discussion at, at the office today. People still don't know what we have three bins because we're a yeah. five star rated green star, you know, building, you know, a little bit of green washing there and, and we have the three bins and yet still no one knows in the office where to put what. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a real gap. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if at the start they did put things in the right slots but I've seen firsthand people just chucking you, you see it every day like people just chucking mm. the bottles in the rubbish bin and vice versa and dirty like food trays and stuff in the recycling bin um there's just in there's just no no education I I don't know if we've had it maybe there was good education around like the keep New Zealand beautiful campaigning when that first came out back what was it like the 80s or something um but we, we haven't had it that I can remember 
at scale, really accessible, really widespread and well acknowledged and implemented in much of my life. I think plastics are more complex now as well. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, you've got yeah. your clear packs, plastics versus your your coloured. Then, if a plastic is already recycled plastic, then there's only certain amount of times you can recycle before you lose the the, the quality degrades. Uh, it's it's so you know, is this cup just paper or is it lined with plastic? Are the t- you know, it's I think it's so much more complex now. Which, mm-hmm. to be fair, how do you separate it? And it is just easier to put a hole in the ground because. Yeah. We've made it and, more and difficult layering, for ourselves. Yeah, well, then layering on that, the greenwashing of bioplastics um, mm-hmm. and, and compostable mm-hmm. versus home compostable. Like, home compostable, I'm all here for when it meets the EU certification and it breaks down in your bin in a couple of weeks. Compostable it's the and biodegradable fast. and degradable is just more plastic. And and a lot of it often yeah. will break down faster into microplastic. <laughs> it's like, yeah. 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 And, and those things don't fit anywhere in, in the sort of recycling and that's And that's the irony yeah. that it's easier to keep it as a simple plastic because there are a couple of pub, uh, private entities in New Zealand, and I'm sure Australia mm-hmm. has the same, but we, back in season one, we had a chat with an expert in the plastic worlds and there are private companies that take the soft plastic and turn it into park benches and fencing and so on. So we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, how much energy it takes to break down the plastic to recreate and so on, because that's another <laughs> rabbit hole for another conversation. But yeah. there, you know, simple plastic is easier. And as soon as it's a compostable courier bag, it's like, well, I don't have a composting means at home. Now mm. I've got to put it in the bin. Whereas if you use the old school, simple plastic, at least I can send it somewhere where at least they can make an effort to yeah. turn it into something usable. So shout out to soft plastics getting rolled out around the country again. I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> well, our red cycle um, scheme's collapsed. It hasn't been operating yeah. for months over here. And like they've had really? issues with that in past years. Like there was a documentary that um, kind of went behind the scenes a little bit and they put a tracker in the bins yeah. at Woolworths, put the soft plastics in there tracked it to a massive landfill at Ipswich. So Ooh, like it wasn't classic. going where it says it was wow. anyway. So there's, there's I, so I know during COVID with... they had to stop the soft plastic collecting here because of yeah. the whole hygiene thing and, you know, and all that. But wow. I think we can start again. Okay. But yeah, it, it's the same thing. And I'm guessing this is what happened in Australia is it's the scale of the waste. Um, yeah. Ultimately for me, like where all of this ends up, the, the freshwater, the offsetting, the plastic waste it's it's ultimately all about us leading lower impact lives yeah and we've been there before and we can get there again um and i think there is a movement happening where more and more people are acknowledging this need um but i do think that it's going to take drive at all scales from the roots right up to government policy to get us there Mm. Um, and this this ties into everything, even climate carbon footprints and the climate change crisis. Like it's just ultimately we need to take up less space on the land. We need to be less intensive in the way that we farm the land to grow our food. We need to use less plastic and use less um, single use goods to consume because we've got solutions to that. You know, you can bake some goods at home and take them in a container, or take a container to a cafe instead of getting a takeaway thing like there's just yeah. there's easy there's easy changes that everyone can make um that i think we just need a lot more education around and education sounds like a dry word so i don't know social media communication whatever we want to say um yeah. social media but, that, that, but that's this platform here as an example yeah, exactly, right? we're, we're exactly. having this conversation and hopefully exactly. we have more than just our mums listening to this but <laughs> you know the the problem currently the space we're currently in is there yeah. is more awareness and more people yeah. do get it, but that's yeah. creating a demand that far outweighs or overruns the ability yeah. to do something about it. So more of us yeah. want to recycle, more of us want to reduce. Yeah. Or, or what, and as Emma said earlier, recycle is at the bottom of the hierarchy. There's these four other things before that. We've had Hannah mm-hmm. Bloomhart on here from you know the rubbish tip twice on the show to remind yeah. us that you know recycle is one of the last resorts. We should be yeah. reduced, reusing, etc. There's more um will to do good there's more people that mm-hmm. want to mm-hmm. actually do something but then the problem is what you're saying what we're lacking is the correct education and instead yeah. Yeah. we're filling that gap with all this greenwashing bullshit okay and 
part of that is, for instance, because one of the biggest contributors or the biggest cause of microplastics in our waterways is from tide degradation. I forget the mm -hmm. figure, but it is a significant component. But now I'm going to, not me personally, just anecdotally, but I'm going to buy an EV, an electric vehicle, because it is better for our planet, but it is not, it's still the exact same tide degradation mm -hmm. happening. And we're still not reducing the amount of PCBs getting into our waterways, for example. So that's the, the currently the problem. And what you've just touched on, it needs to get to the top. It needs to become policy, but that's still not enough. We need the doers because we're still exporting because we still can't do it here. And then the programs we do have here or in Australia are collapsing probably because they're overrun or they're just, there's no, maybe they're not getting the support that they need. You know, maybe there needs to be, instead of a subsidizing, you know, industries that continually are failing and we mm -hmm. won't point those fingers at those same people again. Um, maybe we should be supporting these companies better yeah. to help yeah. the backlog. It's also the backlog. We can make all the change now, but we still have all this backlog of the waste and overconsumption that we still have to deal with mm -hmm. rather than yeah, either putting it on. It's a real challenge. Eh? Yeah. 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 Well, when we we're, when were filming Project Blue, there's a lot that went on behind the scenes that um, you won't, we didn't sort of talk about. Um, like for example, we sat down with Progressive, sorry, not Progressive Fruit Foods, I'm completely brain blank, but the company behind Mother Earth, um, which is like the most ironic um, brand in our supermarket shelves, um, and and said, you know, hey, you guys have a brand that's literally called Mother Earth. What do you want to do to improve your single-use plastics footprint? Um, and as a group of like four of us under 25 talking to these head honchos in the food industry were probably like way overstepping our means, but they were really receptive. Um, and, and they basically said, we don't know what to do. Um, help us. Um, so I really hope they've hired a good sustainability advisor in the meantime, because we weren't that. Um, but part of what else we were doing was, was talking to innovators in the industry. So especially innovators in the packaging industry. And this is acknowledging that they this is still, often single use products or home compostable products. Um, but we were looking at what sort of solutions are being developed around the country to contribute to lessening our plastic footprint. Um, and man, there's some cool stuff going on out there. And, and there's some innovators like backyard, like Kiwi garage vibe <laughs> um, kind of organizations that are doing some really, really good work in this sector. And they're just chomping at the bit for money. Um, and there's, there's really, some really good movers and shakers out there that I think are going to be fundamental to actually making change happen. Um, I'm sure the same thing will be happening. We didn't talk to many, but in the not recycling, but as we can better reuse, not just plastics, but other um, single use goods. And, and ultimately it's a, it's the same thing in the environmental enhancement space. So I work in a lot of catchment management and doing, um, at scale restoration planning um, and enhancement planning and always the gap is funding um, and so I think something that's exciting is MFE so Ministry for Environment is currently working in the waste space on their waste minimization strategy and it's taken a, a pretty big change over the last year in terms of talking a lot more about circularity and getting to circular systems where we're creating products that are designed to be used over and over and over again ideally forever, but not always the case. Um, and then that sort of transition to, if they can't be reused, um, ultimately recycled. And well, that's the stewardship the program system, the, yeah, that, that they have. Which got and, and, binned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, no, sorry, no, it's the CRS. Still... No, not the stewardship yeah. program. I'm talking about the CRS. Yeah, yeah. but the stewardship program, and that, that's got the six key areas, e-waste, um, uh, tires is on there, and there's yeah. four others. I can't remember what they are, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's an attempt, but but it's very slow though. Very it's slow. slow, and that's the problem. Like we 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 need to be doing this stuff now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is slow, but there, so there is work being done that I think will start to channel more funding, hopefully from central government again. Not that they're bottomless pits. Like we really need to look at the way our funding models mm -hmm. work in this space, mm -hmm. um, because that to me is one of the biggest challenges. Um, is there's a, there's a lot of will to do good, but there's not enough funding to make things happen. No, but it's, but it's there's not, no impetus. Not being found. But um, there's no impetus to drive it. The, the product stewardship yeah. program is, was launched, what, three years ago or something. I'm mm. working in the telecommunications world at the moment, and I mm, yeah. happen to find myself now as a representative of my company on, on this 
three years on and they're only now looking at yeah. putting a, a proposal together and only in perhaps 18 months time it's like, but why can't we do anything now why do we need a policy document to start taking action now yeah. and this has been my biggest battle where i work is i'm trying to put some action in place oh no but we need a policy who cares yeah. Because the so, head ups don't care until there's legislation that tells them they have to care. Correct. Right? Yeah. Until there's a there's a financial uh, you know risk correct. to the business, <laughs> yeah. you could have a yeah. fine or you could lose some uh, you know uh, uh, you know your image. But yeah. I, yeah, that's that's it's it's too slow, and that's yeah. the problem. Um, Pro life foods is who you were thinking of. Um, yeah, thank you. The, that's the ones. <laughs> I know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it, and that's that's the challenge that we're at. You know, and we've got a lot of amazing um, movements and amazing organisations doing great things on the ground here, like who we talked about in Project Blue, Atik, with their um, pretty much nil footprint personal care products, um, reusable. You know really pushing the drive to to take your own bowl to get your food because you don't have to have a plastic container um but we really need more scale and and, and a faster pace and i think ultimately for me the biggest thing is advocacy and, and doing what we're doing and doing what project blue is doing and and speaking about this and, and and getting these sort of challenges up in people's faces and educating them about them um and getting people to care because it's it's one thing for us to talk to each other and for us to to be heard by those who are already on board um but it's another thing to recognize that the general public don't necessarily not care but they might not know that these are even problems you know um and and ultimately if they don't know they're not going to vote for the party that's going to make that slow policy change or they're not going to support the company who's making the current um awesome systems changes you know um so I think that that education and advocacy about these issues is so important. Um, yeah, because individuals where, we can, you know. But and that's where things like the documentary for the blue yeah. is so important for community yeah. engagement because it's putting imagery to the facts, and mm. ultimately we're emotive as human beings, so we need yeah. that <laughs> drive as well. Um, but where where can people watch this? Yeah, um, they can watch it. So we've got a, a website, projectblue.co.nz, um, and there's a link on there. We'd like to have it for free, and we will eventually, but it's currently only like eight bucks or something. It's hosted on Vimeo, um, and so you can watch it directly through our website. Uh, we actually sort of had a few screenings this year, uh, some in Auckland. We've got another one coming up to be confirmed in Devonport in Auckland. So we'll let you guys know when we get a date. Yeah, I've that. been waiting out for that one. Come on, give me, me a too. date. <laughs> me too, we're working <laughs> on it. <laughs> um, one at AUT, so I'm working with a, a student at AUT who's looking to get there. He wants as many humans as possible, um, use their big auditorium and, and do a screening there. So again, we'll update you. Um, a, a couple of us have decided to throw a very spontaneous three days warning screening here in Port Nicky, Wellington this week. Um, one that is coming up, a bit further down the line in June, and I believe it's June the 23rd, if we got that right, um, at the NZ Mountain Film Festival. So we'll be screening there, and one of the team Very will be cool. down to do a QA and a there as well, um, because we really like to try and be engaged and, and have discussions afterwards. Um, yeah. So that's a good one to look out for too. Yeah. Well, we'll have the links in the in the show notes. Uh, people can go to the website. I think they can subscribe to get updates on the screenings and so on. So we definitely encourage everyone to do that. Once we've got um, I think the Wellington date you mentioned by the time this is aired, sorry, Wellington, this has happened, but with all the up upcoming dates, hopefully we can, we can share some of those and, and support, support yeah. This, yeah. this wonderful documentary like we have with so many others. Now, just conscious of time, this is great. We're having a good yarn, but we need to get onto the most important component. And we've touched on this throughout the whole conversation, your passion for engagement, but you've also touched on the key component is our community engaging yeah. our community uh, why is that so crucial you know we talk a lot about taking action we talk a lot about the importance of individual action everything amounts to something and then the collective mm. approach is, is a big deal but why is community engagement so crucial yeah i mean ultimately the community is us we're, we're part of it you us three and <laughs> everyone listening um and we're all the ones that are responsible for for our own individual footprints on the ground as well as for contributing to movements um, and contributing to driving change and using our votes to to encourage change in the right direction 
um, more than anything in the environmental space, our communities are the ones who live on the land and, and who have often done so for generations and have those really deep connections to land and and I hope see themselves as the, the guardians of the places that they live in and, and, and operate in. Um, and, you know, humans once upon a time were a little integral, but a, a part of a wider system and there were balances and checks and we weren't the overarching drivers of whether that system was going to be healthy or not. The way that we've come to today, we have a really big influence over the natural world around us and, and we are quite responsible now for whether the health of our natural environment and the future is going to be enhanced or degraded. Um, so that connection between our communities and, and our natural world um, and our communities and the initiatives that we're pushing for is really integral for any of these aspirations to be achieved, um, whether it be lightening our, our plastic footprint, our carbon footprint or our environmental footprint and our freshwater ecosystems. Um, and yeah, just a lot of this as well is recognizing that our communities do bring a lot to the table already. Um, whether it is tangata whenua and that multi-multi-generational connection that they have to the natural environment and to understanding how the systems have changed over time and, and what's driven the current them to be in the current state that they are even beyond and before we started farming and, and channelizing our waterways. Um, or whether it's kids like me who have grown up, you know, being able to play in our ditch and then remember, oh, no, that's filled in. I can't do that anymore. Um, or my urban stream's too dirty. We used to swim there and now I get sick swimming and it. that's gross. Um, you know, we're, we're all impacted by and impact on the world around us. And I just think that, that sometimes our societies become quite um, separated from that fact. But when you do heal that connection, um, that's when you really see magic happen and, and movements happen, whether it's communities or getting out and planting out their streams and, and growing growing numbers of those sort of planting days, again, coming back to the freshwater space. Um, that's really healing and, and rebuilding those connections and they're then becoming or re-becoming custodians of those spaces. And they'll look after them in the future because they won't want to see someone come in and, and chop that all back down again. Um, yeah, examples of which have happened <laughs> recently. Um, mm. Yeah, I just that, that community component component and recognizing that we're part of a greater whole when we have that connection and we care, then it's not just the land getting hurt, it's us getting hurt and we have some actual responsibility and drive to stop that hurt um, or to, to enhance and look after and heal. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> It does. It does. Um, and, and, and one other key thing is, and, you know, it's becoming more prevalent in a lot of discussions that we have. And, yeah, we we often talk about we need to protect. We need to protect what we have. But actually, what we have left is not enough. We need to mm. restore. And this is kind of yeah. circling back now to, you know, your earlier conversation at the beginning is we need to be restoring what we've lost mm. and, mm. and reinstating. How do we do that? You know, to just go out and say, I'm just going to plant some trees. I mean, there needs to be a bit of evidence base in terms of what we're doing is actually going to have an impact over time. Mm -hmm. But what can we as individuals do to do a little bit more than just protecting? Mm -hmm. Picking up rubbish is great. It's protecting our waterways. But mm -hmm. our waterways are so degraded, what can we do to, to repair some of that as an example? So mm -hmm. what can we be doing to be doing a little bit more? Yeah, well, something I'd say to everyone out there who hasn't tried it is do what I did with Project Blue and give it a go getting involved with a community group in your area or a non-profit initiative, whether it be planting trees or, um, yeah, working in the plastic space or whatever. There's groups you can take your pick in, in any initiative, whether it be socially focused and going out and working with communities. Um, but, yeah, get involved. Give it a little bit of time and, and do some voluntary work. It, it doesn't feel like work if you're passionate about it and it's really rewarding. Um, yeah, obviously in the freshwater space, it's it's often tree planting projects are a good way that people can start to have that connection and feel like they're giving back. Um, or like sort of adopt a stream where you're like looking after a reach and, and taking responsibility for monitoring the bugs and the fish and that kind of thing. And you're directly having that engagement with that recovery, um, with the restoration and hopefully the recovery. Um, the same organizations like Sustainable Coastlines are doing really awesome work in the ocean advocacy space, especially in the plastic space. 
looking at how we're getting to turning off at the tap and, and, and ways to be cutting the sources rather than just cleaning up. Um, although I have to say, you know, those those kind of initiatives like beach cleanups are a great way for people to have early exposure um, to actually just getting their hands dirty. So it can be a really good way to go, oh, okay, this is what engaging feels like. I want to do more. Um, yeah, but the, the biggest thing I'd say is there's a lot of groups around New Zealand doing really, really awesome work that are working to enhance, not just to prevent or um, pick up the mess. And all you need to do is look out to your sort of local local boards. So sometimes local councils will have websites that will list different community groups that are active. Um, yeah, you can just do a quick Google and go community group in freshwater enhancement in my area. Like it's really not hard to find these things. Um, but that's the biggest thing I'd say. And especially in Tamaki, where we've got a threat to have a lot of our uh, funding cut to our community initiatives, the more people that are supporting these initiatives, the better. Um, if you can't actually be on the ground, even at least donating or, or getting, getting behind donating can be really good. Um, an organisation where they need a lot of funding, um, but not or can always do it on the ground help, but not as much of that as one like Forest and Bird who are amazing advocates um, for our, particularly our terrestrial environment, but also our freshwater. Um, and they really get to the nitty gritty of things in the policy space as well, advocating. Um, yes, yeah, so supporting those who have got voices in the right spaces is really good. Again, policy is slow, but it's an essential part of the whole. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, I think a message to our listeners: if you're going to support financially, donate to local causes. You know, there's, there's, um, with all due respect, you know, the guys with their clipboards on the on the main streets, that money goes offshore. A lot of it, yeah. it's, it's, um, and and I think there's the the stories of what only one or two percent actually goes to meaningful change. Support local communities. Libraries are great. Lo mm. Contact your local library there effectively are hubs of a lot of amazing community workshops learning how to compost um, all sorts of things and you know and and people some of the guests we've had speak at, at libraries as well i've done it so there's that that's a great resource to have uh you've mentioned one key thing time you've got to put time in it you can't just yeah. say oh you know i wish i could do something you actually have to dedicate time chloe you are someone that dedicates i think all of your time to doing good and um, it's hugely inspiring. And people like yourself, when we have you on the show, um, it, it gives us real hope that, you know, our younger generation, our future leaders have got their heads screwed on right. They've got the, the, the knowledge. They've got some of the skill set and they can drive it. So, but mm -hmm. you're not on your own. We're not letting you stepping back, but we're just saying we've got continuity. And I think that's hugely important. So thank you so much for giving up some of your precious time to come onto the show. Uh, hugely appreciative of it. Really, um, like I said, very inspiring the work that you do. And uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always good to chat. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends.